prayer, we will, you may remain seated as we sing Spirit of Life, first in English and then in Spanish. To the spirit of our life and love and the God that is called by so many names, we ask that you look well upon our gathering today. We gather as we do each and every Sunday to share in community our joys and concerns and may be the hope that we reach out to those who have shared with us here today. In our time together, we send our prayers and good wishes to all those experiencing gun violence once again, be it in Kentucky or Kabul, New Orleans or New York, May healing and hope remain their constant companions. And on this beautiful, rainy, cold winter's day, as we go about our life here on this beautiful spit of land that we call home, may we keep our hearts, mind, and souls on all that is possible. When love, unconditional love abides and hate subsides. In our silence together, may we say aloud the names of those we may be keeping in our hearts, mind, and spirit on this day. May those names be released into this space. those mentioned feel the love of this room. This we pray in, all, in the name of all the helpers of humanity, those living and those not. Amen. Prayer, we will, you may remain seated as we sing Spirit of Life, first in English and then in Spanish. To the spirit of our life and love, and the God that is called by so many names. We ask that you look well upon our gathering today. We gather as we do each and every Sunday to share in community our joys and concerns and may be the hope that we reach out to those who have shared with us here today. In our time together, we send our prayers and good wishes to all those experiencing gun violence once again, be it in Kentucky or Kabul, New Orleans or New York, may healing and hope remain their constant companions. And on this beautiful, rainy, cold winter's day, as we go about our life here on this beautiful spit of land that we call home, May we keep our hearts, mind, and souls on all that is possible. When love, unconditional love abides and hate subsides. In our silence together, may we say aloud the names of those we may be keeping in our hearts, mind, and spirit on this day. May those names be released into this space. May all those mentioned feel the love of this room. This we pray in, all, in the name of all the helpers of humanity, those living and those not. Amen. I have two readings this morning. 
We're going to separate these readings by singing the hymn, uh, so we're doing a little change in the order of service. My fault entirely. <clears throat> uh, but this reading is called Let Me Die Laughing by Reverend Mark Morrison Reed. He writes, We are all dying, our lives always moving forward to completion. We need to learn to live with death and to understand that death is not the worst of all events. We need to fear not death, but life. Empty lives, loveless lives, lives that do not build upon the gift that each of us has been given, lives that are like living deaths, lives which we may never take the time to savor and to appreciate. What we need to fear is not death, but squandering the lives we have been miraculously given. So let me die laughing, savoring one of life's crazy moments. Let me die holding the hand over the one I love and recalling that I tried to love and was forced to love in return. Let me die remembering that life has always been good and that I did what I could. But today, just remind me that I'm dying so that I can live, savor, and love with all of my heart. Here ends the first reading. So we're going to sing again, my friends. I write to you, rise and body your spirit and join in singing hymn number 126, Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. <clears throat> Our second reading is a reading I first heard uh, Reverend Kate do here that I absolutely fell in love with, so I know you've heard it before. It's entitled, How to Give a Blessing by Reverend Kathleen Mateague. We are asked a dozen times, how are you? Most of the time it's not a real question and doesn't invite a genuine answer. It's more like an alternative hello and we're well trained in their ritual passage and response. Oh fine, thanks. But every once in a while we are asked this question when things are really not fine at all. At those times when we're walking around in a little bubble of anxiety or sorrow, something inside of us can suddenly balk at giving out the standard meaningless answer. Fine, thanks. We are too hungry for an authentic word, too raw to pretend that things are okay. The morning after my father died, following three days and nights of an around-the-clock vigil with my siblings, I had to go to the grocery store to buy a few things for dinner. When I arrived at the checkout counter and the clerk distractedly said, How are you? My mind and brain went blank. I couldn't say fine, or even okay. I, I wasn't okay. I wasn't even in my right mind. I was numb, self-deprived, and saturated with the mystery of our mortality. That's the only explanation I had because to my horror, I found myself blurting out a real and honest answer. I'm not so fine, I said. My dad died last night. I'm not so fine. My dad died last night. With his hands filled with the apples and chicken and bread, the poor clerk turned red and started to stammer. The people behind me looking longingly at the checkout lines they should have chosen. <laughs> the ones that would not have placed them in earshot of the much too information lady. I was mortified mortified at having revealed to an unprepared stranger just how not fine I was. Everyone froze in this moment of uncomfortable paralysis except the young man bagging the groceries who had Down syndrome. He stopped moving completely, looked straight at me with his little slur and great emphasis said, 
I bet you feel really sad about that. I bet you feel really sad about that. The simplicity of that little expression of kindness and solidarity allowed both the clerk and me to escape. Yes, I do. Thank you, I said to him. And then I was able to walk out with my groceries and not feel quite so much as though I have just undressed in public. I thought about the encounter for a very long time. The young man bagging groceries would be considered disabled in thought, speech, and movement. Yet he was the only one, the only one, able to offer what counted in that particular moment. He knew how to give a blessing. Here ends today's readings. Excuse me, a glass of water. <clears throat> I have to tell before I begin this sermon that I left all of my sports coats and suits on the island because I'm the part-time minister out there and my stoles. So you have no idea how upset I was when I, what do I wear to church this Sunday? So the only thing I came up with was this beige outfit and it just doesn't work when you're talking about clowns wearing beige. So I did borrow one of Kate's very colorful stoles. So you got to have color when you're talking about clowns. So. <laughs> Hence my drama with dressing, I apologize. <laughs> but I do want to share with you that my first boyfriend was indeed a clown. I'm not like a class clown or a, a clown drunk at a frat or a college party. No, I mean an out and out, wig wearing, red nosed, made up clown. He was a graduate of Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus Clown College in Florida and was in the circus for years. He had awful, awful stories to tell about working in the circus, but of course that's another sermon altogether. When the circus came to his hometown of New York City, he rode the lead elephant in the parade to Madison Square Garden. The post headlines read, Hometown Clown Makes Good. <laughs> Robert was, in his words, a hopeful clown, the tramp in the tradition of the great Otto Gribbling. The tramp clown is like a character-driven comedy as the clown is homeless and traveling the life's road, taking whatever comes his or her way. One thinks of clowns like Charlie Chaplin, the tramp. Although I think today's definition of clowns, Charlie Chaplin is not what would you think about today. We have Ronald McDonald and Clarabelle. Remember Clarabelle? Right, exactly. But not Charlie Chaplin. And a reflection on this past relationship with my clown, now actor, I realized this was certainly Robert's way of being in the world. He was a good-hearted soul whose creativity and wonder with life kept me laughing continually and creating constantly. Whether sitting at a restaurant or waiting our meal or waiting for a subway train, Robert would create in that time together a space for good-hearted laughter or creating something out of an obscure object he happened to find in his pocket. I will always, always be eternally grateful as Robert taught me that a keen sense of humor is, highly, is a high priority in my relationship requirements. You gotta make me laugh, man. You just gotta make me laugh. Exploring the history of clowns and clowning, one finds clowns go as far back as the Greeks and the Romans. Even throughout the Middle Ages, noblemen and royalty all had gestures, jesters or clowns. Court gestures who were privileged characters as long as they did and they said amused their masters. There is a story about a, a court jester who suddenly fell out of favor with the, with the king. The king called him um, and he was so out of favor that he was going to be put to death. But because he entertained the king so well, he gave him a he said, you can choose the way you want to die. And without missing a beat, the clown jester said, 
Very well, Your Majesty. I choose to die of old age. <laughs> That's a clever jester, I think. <laughs> Court jesters were also gifted musicians or mimics, skilled dancers and acrobats full of wit and impertinence. By blood a king, in heart a clown, writes Alfred Lord Tennyson. These clowns or jesters of early history wore a hood or in a donkey ears and often a tail as part of their costume. This was to portray how asinine he was and an object of ridicule not to be taken ser seriously. The hood and tail eventually evolved to that three-pointed cap with bells at each end. The point and cap and tassel scepter became symbols of these jesters. On the old English stage, a clown was a privileged laugh provoker. He had no real part of the drama, but he carried on his jokes and tricks, sometimes undressing himself to the delight audience instead of confining himself to the stage action. Shakespeare himself elevated the clown, giving him speaking parts often using him as a comic relief to ease the tension of the tragedies. The grave diggers in Hamlet are clowns. Othello had his clowns. The clown served a purpose to ease tensions and to elevate the absurdity of life and its predicaments. Such is the case written about in a recent New York Times article. Quote, a surreal political circus is wheeling its way through the frosty streets of Finland's third largest city, the article began. It appears in one ring, ring is a leather-clad vigil anti-group named for a Norse deity calling themselves the Soldiers of Odin. They have taken it upon themselves the task of protecting the city of Tempera from the 1,200 or so people seeking asylum from, Israel, from Syria, Iraq, and other Middle Eastern countries. In the other ring is a troop of clowns who skip through the streets carrying lollipops, feather dusters, and toilet brushes, mocking and sometimes confronting this anti-immigration group, including the soldiers. The clowns call themselves the Logers of Odin and have emerged on the scene in recent weeks as a true champion of multiculturalism. A local Finnish historian who studies extreme right-wing right, right -wing movement said the clown troop was employing the art of parody in an attempt to make anti-immigration fervor and the visual paroles appear absolutely ridiculous. They are basically a performance group who are protesting peacefully and by means of comedy against the extreme right, said the New York Times. The article goes on to explain how the soldiers of Odin explain that no, they are just doing their job of protecting the citizens of their town, especially the women. As the overflux of immigrants continue to cross their borders, some report that the soldiers are having neo-Nazi affiliations, although they insist they are merely a patrol group. Two opposing rings in this circus of life. Both being accused of provocations, one a self-proclaimed vigil anti-group in black leather jackets, the other a clown troop with lollipops, feather dusters, and toilet brushes. Where would your allegiance lie? Not that we're here to pick sides, really, but a troop of clowns pointing out the absurdity of discrimination and bigotry seems like something I could totally, totally support. But again, I do hold a special place in my heart for clowns. Because after all, clowns are people, too. 
This was a t-shirt I actually had made for Robert when we were living together. Um, and we were walking home one night in the village from, us, from a dinner, we noticed that our laundromat was on fire. And all our clothes, of course, were brought to the laundromat. So the people are clowns too, disappeared in a fire. <laughs> And as in Shakespeare's time and plays, these Lodens of Odin are clown troops also serve the exact same purpose, to ease the tensions and to elevate the absurdity of life and its predicaments. Being frightened of a group of individuals simply because of where they come from or the language they speak or their religious affiliations is certainly one of the many absurdities in this life. Unfortunately, one absurdity we witness far, far too often. And yet what brilliantly way to elevate such absurd and bigoted reactions with clowns. Clowns wielding lollipops, feather dusters, and toilet brushes. The other basic reasoning behind clowns and clowning is the simple fact that their goal is to make you laugh. That's right. Simply to make people laugh. Be it laughing at the absurdity of life or all that goes on with its ridiculousness and crazy things, which by the way, the very nature bring out a good, good belly laugh. This has always been the mission of the clown. Laughter. There was a group, actually, that was formed back in the 90s with their mission being what they termed resilience through laughter. As the story goes, in July of 93, a clown from Barcelona, Spain, named Tortola Pelotu, was asked by a group of school children there to help out some of their friends. These Catalan children had been corresponding with children living in a refugee camp in Croatia, who had witnessed the Yugoslav wars in the 90s. The children in the refugee camp told their Catalan friends, you know what we miss most? We miss laughter. We miss having fun and enjoying ourselves. Tortolo took his car and a small group of clowns with him to the camp without any idea of what to expect. Hundreds of children and families greeted them, nearly the entire camp. The clowns performed and then in their laughter and applause, the children asked the team, when will you return again? Thus, Clowns Without Borders was formed. The mission of Clowns Without Borders is to relieve the suffering of all the persons, especially children, who live in areas of crisis, including refugee camps, conflict zones, and other situations of adversity. They partner with individuals and organizations to bring small teams of professional performing artists to share performances and workshops with children and their families in refugee camps, conflict zones, or with communities who have experienced trauma or crisis. And they do bring laughter. Theologian Reinhard Niebuhr recalls, humor is a prelude to faith and laughter is the beginning prayer. Performing at refugee camps for people who've lost everything is bringing humor and thus rebuilding a faith in humanity and certainly the sounds of laughter from the young and innocent is an answer to many of the prayers of their families. Many of the volunteer clowns say that, that there is the connection they make with the people in the camps, young and old alike. One father from Syria remarked that he had not seen his seven-year-old son smile or laugh since they left their homeland. When the clowns arrived, it was like everything else was just totally forgotten. He finally saw his son's beautiful smile and heard his laughter once again. Laughter connects you with people, writes British comedian John Cleese. It's impossible to maintain any kind of distance or any sort of social hierarchy when you are simply howling with laughter. It's an interesting image. <laughs> 
In other words, this is what clowns have to offer, be it clowns without borders, the loggers of Odin, clowns with a little flair of gaiety, class clowns, circus clowns, is bringing humor and laughter and healing to any situation. Our readings this morning reflect the importance of laughter and in clowns, especially the reading Let Me Die Laughing, first simply for the great title and then for its insightful message on the fear of death. As the author states, dying when it is unfulfilled life, the empty life, which is what we should really be fearing. I believe such wisdom as it challenges us to remain open, just remain open to whatever comes our way. It pokes and prods us as a bit to find a place of meaning in our lives, and it asks us to give back, as in the signs giving and receiving. This is the kind of energy that creates life. With our heart and minds open to the typical greeting, how are you, may just be met with an honest and open response. Not so good. My father died today. And then what you receive back, oh, I bet you feel really sad about that. You are heard by the one the world, world calls disabled. And you walk away with a blessing. A well-developed sense of humor, writes co uh, comic William Ward, is the pole that balances to your steps as you walk the tightrope of life. Humor is the pole that adds balance to your life. Adding balance to your life with humor and laughter helps us prepare with each step, each and every step. I recall all of my steps being taken with great care and with humor, as last year about this time, I was away on vacation, and I fell on my second day of vacation and broke my ankle, my left ankle. A year ago, it was my right ankle. It was the exact same bone, go figure. Keeping my sense of humor during my remaining nine days on my Costa Rica vacation was very important to me, if not also for my traveling companions. Coming home, well, let's just say that um, created a different kind of situation. First, the best way to come home is in a, you come traveling overseas, you come home in a wheelchair and in crutches, you zoom through customs. In me, there's no waiting in line. That was the best thing about that. And much of this easygoing attitude dissolved when I was fitted with a boot and once again found myself on crutches. My sense of humor and laughter came much later as I all alone tried to struggle to elevate the foot and then ice it and then try to figure out how to put this darn boot on with all their Velcro wrappings and everything. So I eventually got so frustrated I just took this boot and I just threw it right across the room as well with the crutch and kind of screamed out some pretty unministerial language and phrases. But only after I did that did the laughter begin? Very slowly at first, but finally enough to shake me out of my place of self-pity. With each laugh, the tension in my body lessened until I finally just collapsed on my couch and simply could not stop laughing. It was pure release. Now that did not heal my ankle, unfortunately. <laughs> But it healed later, but it was my attitude that immediately changed. Finding myself, and whenever we find ourselves, able to laugh at some of our latest predicaments, that's the healing balm I think we all need. It's like that joke. You know how to make God laugh? Tell your plans. So the next time someone asks you, how are you? Don't be caught off guard. Rather, be honest name it, and name the situation. Be it a fractured ankle again or you're a loss in your life. Name the feelings and receive a blessing from those around you. 
Yes, my friends, as you find yourself suddenly faced with some disheartening situation, a fractured ankle, a new diagnosis, a conflict, or confrontation, before you jump into the state of frustration, anger, or fear, find a sense of humor with that situation. Send in the clowns. Send in the laughter. And let the humor and the absurdity of this life be the healing balm and the blessing which is coming your way. Amen. And blessed be. My friends, a good laugh overcomes more difficulties and dissipates more dark clouds than any other one thing. Go in peace, my friends, and please be seated for the postlude.